Chapter six of Detailed Minutiae of Soldier Life in the Army of Northern Virginia, eighteen sixty one through eighteen sixty five, by Carlton McCarthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. Detailed Minutiae of Soldier Life in the Army of Northern Virginia, eighteen sixty one through eighteen sixty five. By Carlton McCarthy. Chapter six Comforts, Conveniences, and Consolations. Have you ever been a soldier? No? Then you do not know what comforts are. Conveniences you never had. Animal consolations? Never. You have not enjoyed the great exceptional luxuries which once in a century, perhaps, bless a limited number of men. How sad that you have allowed your opportunity to pass unimproved. But you have been a soldier. Ah, then let us together recall with pleasure the past. Once more be hungry and eat, once more tired and rest, once more thirsty and drink, once more cold and wet, let us sit by the roaring fire and feel comfort creep over us. So, isn't it very pleasant? Now let us recount, repossess rather, the treasures which once were ours, never forgetting that values have shrunk, and that the times have changed, and that men also are changed some happily, some woefully. Possibly we also are somewhat modified. Eating, you will remember, was more than a convenience. It was a comfort which rose almost to the height of a consolation. Probably the most universally desired comfort of the Confederate soldier was something to eat. But this, like all greatly desired blessings, was shy, and when obtained was, to the average seeker, not replete with satisfaction. But he did eat, at times, with great energy, great endurance, great capacity, and great satisfaction. The luscious slapjack, sweetened perhaps with sorghum, the yellow and odiferous soda biscuit, ash cake, or, it might chance to be, the faithful hardtack, which our friends the enemy called crackers, serving in rotation as bread. The faithful hog was everywhere represented. His cheering presence was manifested most agreeably by the sweet odors flung to the breeze from the frying pan, that never failing and always reliable utensil. The solid slices of streaked lean and fat, the limpid gravy, the brown pan of slosh inviting you to sop it, and the rare delicate shortness of the biscuit made the homely animal to be in high esteem. Beef, glorious beef, how seldom were you seen, and how welcome was your presence! In the generous pot you parted with your mysterious strength and sweetness. Impaled upon the cruel ramrod you suffered slow torture over the fire. Sliced, chopped, and pounded, boiled, stewed, fried, or broiled, always a trusty friend and sweet comforter. Happy the fire where the stray pig found a lover, and unhappy the pig. Innocence and youth were no protection to him, and his cries of distress availed him not as against the cruel purpose of the rude soldiery. What is that faint aroma which steals about on the night air? Is it a celestial breeze? No, it is the mist of the coffee boiler. Do you not hear the tumult of the tumbling water? Poor man, you have eaten, and now other joys press upon you. Drink, drink more! Near the bottom it is sweeter. Providence hath now joined together for you the bitter and the sweet. There is sugar in that cup. Some poor fellows, after eating, could only sleep. They were incapable of the noble satisfaction of a good smoke. But there were some good men and true, thoughtful men, quietly disposed men, gentle and kind, who, next to a good square meal, prized a smoke. Possibly here begins consolation. Who can find words to tell the story of the soldier's affection for his faithful briar-root pipe? As the cloudy incense of the weed rises in circling wreaths about his head, as he hears the murmuring of the fire, and watches the glowing and fading of the embers, and feels the comfort of the hour pervading his mortal frame, what bliss! But yonder sits a man who scorns the pipe, and why? He is a chewer of the weed. To him, the sweetness of it seems not to be drawn out by the fiery test, but rather by the persuasion of moisture and pressure. But he, too, is under the spell. There are pictures in the fire for him also, and he watches them come and go. Now draw near. Are not those cheerful voices? Do you not hear the contented tones of men sitting in a cozy home? 
What glowing hopes here leap out in rapid words! No bitterness of hate, no revenge, no cruel purpose, but simply the firm resolve to march in the front of their country's defenders. Would you hear a song? You shall, for even now they sing. Aha! A song for the trumpet's tongue, for the bugle to sing before us, when our gleaming guns like clarions shall thunder in battle chorus. Would you hear a soldier's prayer? Well, there kneels one, behind that tree. But he talks with God. You may not hear him, nor I. But now there they go, one by one. No, two by two. Down goes an old rubber blanket, and then a good thick woolen one, probably with a big U.S. in the center of it. Down go two men. They are hidden under another of the U.S. blankets. They are resting their heads on their old battered haversacks. They love each other to the death, those men, and sleep there like little children locked in close embrace. They are asleep now. No, not quite. They are thinking of home, and it may be of heaven. But now surely they are asleep. No, they are not quite asleep. They are falling off to sleep. Happy soldiers, they are asleep. At early dawn the bugle sounds the reveille. Shout answers to shout, the roll is called, and the day begins. What new joys will it bring? Let us stay and see. The sun gladdens the landscape. The fresh air, dashing and whirling over the fields and through the pines, is almost intoxicating. Here are noble chestnut oaks, ready for the axe and the fire, and there, at the foot of the hill, a mossy spring. The oven sits enthroned on glowing coals, crowned with fire. The coffee boils, the meat fries, the soldier smiles and waits. But waiting is so very trying that some, seizing towels, soap, and comb from their haversacks, step briskly down the hill and plunge their heads into the cool water of the brook. Then their cheeks glow with rich color, and, chatting merrily, they seek again the fire, carrying the old bucket brimming full of water for the mess. All hands welcome the bucket, and breakfast begins. Now see the value of a good tin plate. What a treasure that tin cup is, and that old fork! Who would have a more comfortable seat than that log affords? But here comes the mail. Papers, letters, packages. Here comes news from home, sweet, tender, tearful, hopeful, sad, distressing news. Joyful news of victory and sad news of defeat. Pictures of happy homes or sad wailing over homes destroyed. But the mail has arrived, and we cannot change the burden it has brought. We can only pity the man who goes empty away from the little group assembled about the mail bag, and rejoice with him who strolls away with a letter near his heart. Suppose he finds therein the picture of a curly head, just four years old. Suppose the last word in it is mother. Or suppose it concludes with a signature having that peculiarly helpless but courageous and hopeful air which can be imparted only by the hand of a girl whose heart goes with the letter. Once more, happy, happy soldier. The artilleryman tarrying for a day only in a camp had only time to eat and do his work. Roll call, drill, watering the horses, greasing caissons and gun carriages, cleaning, repairing, and greasing harness, cleaning the chests of the limbers and caissons, storing and arranging ammunition, and many little duties filled the day. In the midst of a campaign, comfortable arrangements for staying were hardly completed by the time the bugle sounded the assembly and orders to move were given. But however short the stay might be, the departure always partook of the nature of a move from home. More especially was this true in the case of the sick man, whose weary body was finding needed rest in the camp, and peculiarly true of the man who had fed at the table of a hospitable neighbor, and for a day, perhaps, enjoyed the society of the fair daughters of the house. Orders to move were frequently heralded by the presence of the courier, a man who rarely knew a word of the orders he had brought, who was always besieged with innumerable questions, always tried to appear to know more than his position allowed him to disclose, and who never ceased to be an object of interest to every camp he entered. Many a gallant fellow rode the country over, many a one led in the thickest of the fight and died bravely, known only as my courier. When the leaves began to fall and the wind to rush in furious frolics through the woods, the soldier's heart yearned for comfort. Chilling rains, cutting sleet, drifting snow, muddy roads, all the miseries of approaching winter, pressed him to ask and repeat the question, when will we go into winter quarters? 
After all, the time did come, but first the place was known. The time was always doubtful. Leisurely and steady movement towards the place might be called the first comfort of winter quarters, and as each day's march brought the column nearer the appointed camp, the anticipated pleasures assumed almost the sweetness of present enjoyment. But at last comes the welcome, left into park, and the fence goes down, the first piece wheels through the gap, the battery is parked, the horses are turned over to the horse sergeant, the old guns are snugly stowed under the tarpaulins, and the winter has commenced. The woods soon resound with the ring of the axe, trees rush down, crashing and snapping to the ground, fires start here and there till the woods are illuminated, and the brightest, happiest, busiest night of all the year falls upon the camp. Now around each fire gathers the little group who are, for a while, to make it the center of operations. Hasty plans for comfort and convenience are eagerly discussed till late into the night, and await only the dawn of another day for execution. Roll call over and breakfast eaten, the work of the day commences with the preparation of comfortable sleeping places, varying according to the material on hand. A favorite arrangement for two men consisted of a bed of clean straw between the halves of a large oak log, covered, in the event of rain, with a rubber blanket. The more ambitious builders made straw pens, several logs high, and pitched over these a fly tent, adding sometimes a chimney. In this structure, by the aid of a bountiful supply of dry, clean straw and their blankets, the occupants bade defiance to cold, rain, and snow. Other men, gifted with that strange facility for comfort without work which characterizes some people, found resting places ready-made. They managed to steal away night after night and sleep in the sweet security of a haystack, a barn, a stable, a porch, or, if fortune favored them, in some farmer's feather bed. Others still, but more especially the infantry and cavalry, built shelters open to the south, covered them with pine tags and brush, built a huge fire in front, and made themselves at home for a season. But all these things were mere makeshifts, temporary stopping places, occupying about the same relation to winter quarters as the boarding house does to a happy and comfortable home. During the occupancy of these, and while the work of building was progressing, the Confederate soldier wrote many letters home. He saw an opportunity for enjoyment ahead, and tried to improve it. His letters were somewhat after the following order. Camp near Williams Mill, December 2nd, 1864 Dear Father, You will no doubt be glad to hear that we are at last in winter quarters. We are quite comfortably fixed, though we arrived here only two days ago. We are working constantly on our log cabins, and hope to be in them next week. We are near the blank railroad, and anything you may desire to send us may be shipped to blank depot. If you can possibly spare the money to buy them, please send at once four pounds tenpenny nails, one pair wrought hinges for door, one good axe, two pairs shoes, one for me and one for J, four pairs socks, two for me and two for J, five pounds kilokinic smoking tobacco, one pound bicarb soda. Please send also two or three old church music books, and any good books you are willing to part with forever. Underclothing of any sort, shirts, drawers, socks, cotton or woolen, would be very, very acceptable, as it is much less trouble to put on the clean and throw away the soiled clothes than to wash them. Some coffee, roasted and ground, with sugar to match, and anything good to eat, would do to fill up. Do not imagine, however, that we are suffering or unhappy. Our only concern is for all at home, and if compliance with the above requests would cost you the slightest self-denial at home, we would rather withdraw them. Why don't blank and blank go into the army? They are old enough, hardy enough, able to provide themselves with every comfort, and ought to be here. Many furloughs will be granted during the winter, and we may get home, some of us, before another month is past. Love to mother, dear mother, and to sister, and tell them we are happy and contented. Write as soon as you can, and believe me, your affectionate son, blank, blank, blank. P.S. Don't forget the tobacco. W. And now another night comes to the soldier, inviting him to nestle in clean straw, under dry blankets, and sleep. 
Tomorrow he will lay the foundation of a village destined to live till the grass grows again. Tomorrow he will be architect, builder, and proprietor of a cozy cabin in the woods. Let him sleep. A pine wood of heavy original growth furnishes the ground and the timber. Each company is to have two rows of houses, with a street between, and each street is to end on the main road to the railroad depot. The width of the street is decided, it is staked off, each mess selects its site for a house, and the work commences. The old pines fall rapidly under the energetic strokes of the axes, which glide into the hearts of the trees with a malicious and cruel willingness. The logs are cut into lengths, notched and fitted one upon another, and the structure begins to rise. The builders stagger about here and there under the weight of the huge logs, occasionally falling and rolling in the snow. They shout and whistle and sing, and are as merry as children at play. At last the topmost log is rolled into place, and the artistic work commences, the riving of slabs. Short logs of oak are to be split into huge shingles for the roof, and tough and tedious work it is. But it is done, the roof is covered in, and the house is far enough advanced for occupancy. Now the bunks, which are simply broad shelves one upon another, wide enough to accommodate two men, spoon fashion, are built. Merry parties sally forth to seek the straw stack of the genial farmer of the period, and, returning heavily laden with sweet clean straw, bestow it in the bunks. Here they rest for a night. Next day the chimney, built like the house of notched sticks or small logs, rises rapidly, till it reaches the apex of the roof and is crowned with a nail keg or flour barrel. Next a pit is dug deep enough to reach the clay. Water is poured in and the clay well mixed, and the whole mess takes in hand the daubing of the chinks. Every crack and crevice of house and chimney receives attention at the hands of the builders, and when the sun goes down the house is proof against the most searching winter wind. Now the most skillful man contrives a door and swings it on its hinges. Another makes a shelf for the old water bucket. A short bench or two appear, like magician's work, before the fire, and the family is settled for the winter. It would be a vain man indeed who thought himself able to describe the happy days and cozy nights of that camp. First among the luxuries of settled life was the opportunity to part forever with a suit of underwear which had been on constant duty for possibly three months, and put on the sweet clean clothes from home. They looked so pure, and the very smell of them was sweet. Then there was the ever-present thought of a dry, warm, undisturbed sleep the whole night through. What a comfort! Remember now, there is a pile of splendid oak ready cut for the fire, within easy reach of the door, several cords of it, and it is all ours. Our mess cut it and toted it there. It will keep a good fire night and day for a month. The wagons, which have been over the mountains and far away, have come into camp loaded with the best flour in abundance, droves of cattle are bellowing in the road, and our commissary, as he hurries from camp to camp with the glad tidings, is the embodiment of happiness. All this means plenty to eat. This is a good time to make and carve beautiful pipes of hard wood with horn mouthpieces, very comfortable chairs, bread trays, haversacks, and a thousand other conveniences. At night the visiting commences, and soon in many huts are little social groups close around the fire. The various incidents of the campaign pass in review, and pealing laughter rings out upon the crisp winter air. Then a soft, sweet melody floats out of that cabin door as the favorite singer yields to the entreaty of his little circle of friends, or a swelling chorus of manly voices chanting a grand and solemn anthem, stirs every heart for half a mile around. Now think of an old Confederate veteran, who passed through Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and the wilderness, sitting in front of a cheerful fire in a snug log cabin, reading, say, The Spectator. Think of another by his side, reading a letter from his sweetheart, and another still, a warm and yearning letter from his mother. Think of two others in the corner playing old sledge, or, it may be, chess. Here another, off guard, snoring in his bunk. Ah, what an amount of condensed contentment that little hut contains. And now the stables are finished. The whole battalion did the work, and the poor old shivering and groaning horses are under cover. 
and the guardhouse, another joint production, opens wide its door every day to receive the unhappy men whose time for detail has at last arrived. The chapel, an afterthought, is also ready for use, having been duly dedicated to the worship of God. The town is complete, and its citizens are happy. Men thus comfortably fixed, with light guard duty and little else to do, found time, of course, to do a little foraging in the country around. By this means often during the winter the camp enjoyed great abundance and variety of food. Apples and apple butter, fresh pork, dried fruit, milk, eggs, risen bread, and even cakes and preserves. Occasionally a whole mess would be filled with the liveliest expectations by the information that Bob or Joe was expecting a box from home. The wagon comes into camp escorted by the expectant Bob and several of his intimate friends. The box is dropped from the wagon to the ground, off goes the top, and in go busy hands and eyes. Here are clothes, shoes, and hats. Here is coffee, sugar, soda, salt, bread, fresh butter, roast beef, and turkey. Here is a bottle, marked to be used in case of sickness or wounds. Here is paper, ink, pen, and pencil. What shall be done with this pile of treasure? It is evident one man cannot eat the eatables or smoke the tobacco in pipes. Call in, then, the friendly aid of willing comrades. They come, they see, they devour. And now the ever-true and devoted citizens of the much and often besieged city of Richmond conclude to send a New Year's dinner to their defenders in the army. That portion destined for the camp above described arrived in due time in the shape of one good turkey. Each of the three companies composing the battalion appointed a man to draw straws for the turkey. The successful company appointed a man from each detachment to draw again. Then the detachment messes took a draw, and the fortunate mess devoured the turkey. But the soldiers, remembering that in times past they had felt constrained to divide their rations with the poor of that city, did not fail in gratitude or question the liberality of those who had, in the midst of great distress, remembered with self-denying affection the soldiers in the field. Not the least among the comforts of life in winter quarters was the pleasure of sitting under the ministrations of an amateur barber, and hearing the snip-snip of his scissors, as the long growth of hair fell to the ground. The luxury of a shave, the possession of comb, brush, small mirror, towels, and soap, boots blacked every day, white collars, and occasionally a starched bosom, called, in the expressive language of the day, a biled shirt, completed the restoration of the man to decency. Now, also, the soldier with painful care threaded his needle with huge thread, and with a sort of left-handed awkwardness sewed on the long absent button, or, with even greater trepidation, attempted a patch. At such a time the soldier pondered on the peculiar fact that war separates men from women. A man cannot thread a needle with ease, certainly not with grace. He sews backwards. In winter quarters every man had his chum or bunkmate, with whom he slept, walked, talked, and divided hardship or comfort as they came along, and the affectionate regard of each for the other was often beautiful to see. Many such attachments led to heroic self-denials and death one for the other, and many such unions remain unbroken after twenty years have passed away. It was a rare occurrence, but occasionally the father or mother or brother or sister of some man paid him a visit. The males were almost sure to be very old or very young. In either case they were received with great hospitality, given the best place to sleep, the best the camp afforded in the way of eatables, and treated with the greatest courtesy and kindness by the whole command. But the lady visitors, the girls, who could describe the effect of their appearance in camp? They produced conflict in the soldier's breast. They looked so clean, they were so gentle, they were so different from all around them, they were so attractive, they were so agreeable and sweet and fresh and happy, that the poor fellows would have liked above all things to have gotten very near to them and have heard their kind words, possibly shake hands, but no, some were barefooted, some almost bareheaded, some were still expecting clean clothes from home, some were sick and disheartened, some were on guard, some in the guard house, and others too modest. And so, to many, the innocent visitor became a sort of pleasant agony, as it were, a bitter sweet. Nothing ever so promptly convinced a Confederate soldier that he was dilapidated and not altogether as neat as he might be, 
as sudden precipitation into the presence of a neatly dressed, refined, and modest woman. Fortunately for the men, the women loved the very rags they wore, if they were gray, and when the war ended they welcomed with open arms and hearts full of love the man and his rags. Preaching in camp was to many a great pleasure and greatly profitable. At times intense religious interest pervaded the whole army, and thousands of men gladly heard the tidings of salvation. Many afterwards died triumphant, and many others are yet living, daily witnesses of the great change wrought in them by the preaching of the faithful and able men who, as chaplains, shared the dangers, hardships, and pleasures of the campaign. To all the foregoing comforts and conveniences must be added the consolation afforded by the anticipation and daily expectation of a furlough, which meant, of course, a blissful reunion with the dear ones at home, perhaps an interview or two with that historic maid who is left behind by the soldier of all times and lands, plenty to eat, general admiration of friends and relatives, invitations to dine, to spend a week, and last, but not least, an opportunity to express contempt for every able-bodied bomb-proof found sneaking about home. Food, shelter, and rest, the great concerns, being thus all provided for, the soldier enjoyed intensely his freedom from care and responsibility, living, as near as a man may, the innocent life of a child. He played marbles, spun his top, played at football, bandy, and hopscotch, slept quietly, rose early, had a good appetite, and was happy. He had time now comfortably to review the toils, dangers, and hardships of the past campaign, and with allowable pride to dwell on the cheerfulness and courage with which he had endured them all, and to feel the supporting effect of the unanimity of feeling and pervasive sympathy which linked together the rank and file of the army. Leaving out of view every other consideration, he realized with exquisite delight that he was resisting manfully the coercive force of other men, and was resolved to die rather than yield his liberty. He felt that he was beyond doubt in the line of duty, and expected no relief from toil by any other means than the accomplishment of his purpose and the end of the war. To strengthen his resolve he had ever present with him the unchanging love of the people for whom he fought, the respect and confidence of his officers, unshaken faith in the valor of his comrades and the justice of his cause, and, finally, he had an opportunity to brace himself for another, and, if need be, for still another struggle, with the ever-increasing multitude of invaders, hoping that each would usher in the peace so eagerly coveted and the liberty for which already a great price had been paid. Was he not badly disappointed? End of chapter 6